Ontario's north has plenty of wildlife, but it's a problem with domesticated animals that's got the attention of our hubmeisters this week. In particular, dog overpopulation in First Nations communities. Joining us now on the efforts of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to tackle this, from our studio at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Claude Sharma, who heads up our Northeastern Ontario hub, and with us here in studio, J.N. Jagannathan, our Ontario Hubs field producer. Gentlemen, good to be with you again this evening here on TVO. Claude, let's go to you first. You went to Manitoulin Island, about two hours west of your current location, uh, to write a piece that people can read on our website, tvo.org, about the dog overpopulation that exists in some First Nations communities. What did you find out? Well, first, Steve, let's kind of define what dog overpopulation is. It's pretty simple. Too many dogs, too few homes, or more dogs in these communities than there are houses and places of care to house them in. Now, each area, though, is also unique. You got to think of uh, there are some communities that are in the far, far north that uh, don't have the resources, the ones that do maybe closer to an area like Sudbury. Veterinarian and animal welfare care can be 20, 30, 40 minutes away for one First Nation community. It could be a flight and a couple hour drive for another one. Now these roaming dogs too, what happens is the overpopulation happens and then these dogs, a lot of them are uncared for, uh, some of them die and some of them attract diseases. So what happens is, is that these, uh, these communities will have to get services to come in from Southern Ontario to help them out and from Central Ontario as well. And what they do is they bring these dogs from these communities back to down south to kind of help alleviate the problem. But one SPCA official told me that these dog overpopulations in these northern communities are of an epidemic proportion. And this is not a new problem as well. This is uh, something that's been going on for a number of years, but it's just getting more attention over the past five to ten years, especially with social media. Okay, Jane, you went up to Thunder Bay to check out the situation there. What did you find? Well, historically, dogs have played a, a big role in First Nations communities, whether it's for safety or protection or for hunting. And uh, as, as Claude alluded to, unrestricted budgets, there's only so much that you can do. Um, you know, there are no vets there on a full-time basis, basis in some of these communities. Good luck getting a leash at some of these stores. Food prices are up, you know, are are sometimes double, triple what we would pay for here. So the overpopulation problem really comes from the economic issues facing these communities. Claude, is this a situation where if you were, say, a visitor to some of these First Nations places, you would, you would actually see lots of dogs roaming in the streets, and would you feel unsafe? Uh, yeah, um, just to give you an example of what happened uh, recently in Winnipeg in a Northern Ontario community, a woman there was mauled by a pack of dogs and uh, she died. And when I went to uh, Wikwimakong First Nation, uh, it's also known as uh, Wikwimakong Unceded Territory and uh, Wiki, uh, someone there told me that uh, a few years back when the population was getting out of hand, that some of the dogs there would steal the kids' lunches from the schools. And there's also some problems too with biting. So uh, these populations, uh, they, they kind of can come in packs and they can uh, affect safety in a number of ways. Uh, we've got a picture that we're going to bring up right now, which you took. Uh, tell us uh, where this picture was taken and what we're looking at. So this is in Week Wimkong Unceded Territory, which is about two hours uh, southwest of Sudbury. And uh, you can see a, a woman on the left, uh, that's uh, Jean Flamond, and the gentleman to uh, the right is uh, that's Bruno Henry, and they're a part of the Wiki Res Dog Group there, and they're uh, with three adopted dogs. Uh, you can see two chocolate labs, uh, Coco and Hershey, who were brought in, adopted from Sudbury, and were uh, their sisters, and they were spayed by a nearby animal hospital. So they are brought in to the community uh, responsibly. These dogs don't look dangerous, though. I, I know, uh, these dogs were, I guess you can almost say, too friendly. Uh, they were jumping on me, uh, getting dirt on me, trying to lick me. Uh, very, very, very friendly. And uh, when I would be driving away, they, they'd come up to my car and kind of like, no, don't, don't go, stay, please. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they, they were well cared for and definitely friendly. Well, that is a very sweet picture, but I, I, I think your friend Jayan here actually has you one-upped. Uh, <laughs> Sheldon, you want to bring this next picture up? We're trying to give, I guess, the impression here that this is a big problem, and <laughs> Jay, and that picture does not convey that this is a big problem. What's no, going on here? That is Goku, 
nine and a half weeks old. Uh, he was brought in uh, just a day earlier from when that did, that photo was taken. Um, I just wanted to talk, uh, Claude had mentioned uh, the safety of, of, of people out there, but it's also a safety issue for the dogs. In the case of, of Goku, you know, these are dogs that are roaming, they start to pack, and in some cases, especially when dogs are mating, it can be very aggressive. And so this rescue group that I did a profile on is called the Northern Reach Rescue Network. They work with the First Nations communities there, and they bring in dogs uh, via uh, the local airlines there to Thunder Bay. And what they're seeing is a lot of these dogs have, you know, bite marks, have, um, you know, have either been on a rope or a leash for a really long time and have kind of deep wounds. So they get them to get the, they take them straight to a vet if they need the help. They get them into a foster care in Thunder Bay, and that's where they'll stay before they get adopted. So uh, just last month when we were there, they were getting about a dog every day. And we're talking, you know, ranging in, in, in ages from a, a litter of pups to about three or four years old. So, Claude, the First Nation you went to, I presume we're talking about Wiki right now, is also trying to solve this problem. What are they up to? Well, they're doing a number of things. The picture that you saw before with Jean and Bruno, uh, they're part of the Wiki Res Dog Group, and what they're trying to do is help with the overpopulation. So uh, they uh, created partnerships with the Welland SPCA in the Niagara region. So what the Welland SPCA does is they bring up a mobile spay and neuter clinic. They come to the community, they spay and neuter the dogs at a local arena. People bring in their dogs and their cats as well, and they also provide other services like vaccinations. So that's one way they're tackling the problem. And 700 dogs have been rehomed throughout Ontario from that First Nation community since uh, 2014. So progress is definitely being made there in Wiki. And they're also uh, reaching out to uh, their people. Uh, they want to educate them because they kind of want to tell the, the, the difference between there's the idea of having a dog versus the reality. The idea is, yes, you can get a puppy, uh, he or she can be cute, but then the reality is these puppies grow up and these puppies uh, can breed, which can cause the overpopulation. And also the Band Council too funds programs, funds spay and neuter programs to uh, help uh, eradicate this problem. Gotcha. Jan, let me ask you, uh, the rescue group you talked about, I presume, is non-Indigenous? Correct. They are dealing with Indigenous communities in their work? Right. I don't have to tell our viewers that occasionally when Indigenous and non-Indigenous try to work together, it, you know, that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. How's this going? You know, this is a long process. This, um, the person who started this organization has been in contact with these communities for years and has been working with them. Um, and, you know, you simply can't go on to a First Nations community and just start taking dogs. We've heard stories about this and they don't go well. Some of these dogs are taken care of and are loved, but they just, the, the owners just don't have the means to take care of them. So this community, what they do is they actually work with the, the owners who are surrendering their dogs or any of the dogs uh, that they find, and they send back photos uh, to these people. Uh, this is what your dog is doing now. They also are working with the issue of um, sending up collars, food, and stuff like that. And what I think is one of the most important things is the dogs, you know how you, if you ever go to a shelter, you always see where this, you know, this cat or dog has come from, some history. They try not, to, what they do is they don't put uh, what community they come from uh, because they don't want to build a stereotype with a certain community. And so they work really closely with that and just try not to create those negative stereotypes that, you know, some people may have when it comes to First Nations and Northern Dogs. Understood. You've got a field piece you're going to show us, right? I do, indeed. Okay. So you want to throw to this? I do. I take a closer look at uh, one organization that is help, helping solve the First Nations dog issue, all while balancing the relationships with Indigenous communities. Very good. Sheldon, go. You're a good boy. Meet Goku. At nine and a half weeks, he's one of the newest additions to the Northern Reach Rescue Network. Tracy Switzer is a foster parent with Northern Reach Rescue Network. The organization works with Northern Ontario's Indigenous communities that are overrun with stray dogs. When we get a dog in, in care, we always do a, like a head to toe, like you do with first aid, and check them, make sure that uh, they're in good health, they're clean, they're no ear mites, no injuries that we don't know about. Had a long journey, let's just say, and been in a kennel. So, um, yeah, then we, and we've feed them, give them their water, get them all cleaned up and then get them comfortable and then try to give them privacy for the first 
first 24 hours, we try not to do too much with them. Many of the Pretty dogs they rescue right. are malnourished, yeah. scared, and sometimes yeah. injured. And the spots behind his ears, which where the wire was digging in and really cutting through, that's all healed up. I had one foster that came in that was scared of the floor. <laughs> He was scared of the floor, so when he started walking on one type of floor, then he saw there was a different type of floor, and he just flattened right out. I mean, they're scared of, some of them are scared of everything. Historically, dogs in the north have been used for protection and hunting, but a lack of basic animal services like veterinarians has created an issue in some northern communities. You take a community of, say, 500 people, and there's 800 dogs in that community, you can imagine how overrun that community is because they are free roaming. You go to any northern store, there's going to be 20 to 30 dogs around there. And that's the urgent care food. Darlene Vesna is the founder of Northern Reach Rescue Network. With the help of over 50 volunteers and foster families, she has rescued thousands of dogs. One day I got a call from a friend of mine that lived up north and her dog had been run over by a car. And this dog was laying basically in the snowbank and there was no help, there was no pain meds, there was no crate, there was no nothing. And I got networking and, and messaged a few friends and found a rescue for them and, and they sent the crate and it took three days to get the crate there. And I thought there's got to be a better way. The dogs are flown into Thunder Bay, where they are temporarily fostered. And during this past spring, the rescue was flying in dogs more than once a week. Get some toys. Tracy Switzer also helps ensure other families have enough food, toys, and medication. But the organization also sends them to communities up north. They're all just skin and bones. I mean, food, dog food up in the northern communities is very expensive. And I mean, we send some up as, as much as we can. We have a... Uh, we have people that do that, but um, they're, most of them are just, they're hungry, they're starved for attention. You know, many of these northern stores, you can't buy a collar, you can't buy a leash. There's nothing for the dogs. It also creates a safety concern for everyone in the community. When the females go into heat, you have the males packing up, they're, they're fighting with each other, they're fighting over the females, they're aggressive. Uh, a child walking to school with a sandwich in their pocket is going to be a target. Vesna has spent a decade building relationships with northern communities. Many of them are gated and require permission from the chief and council to enter. The organization also doesn't release the location of where these dogs are coming from to protect the communities from any negative labels. At one time, a, a big mistrust of rescues. Uh, rescues going into communities and just taking dogs. And that, that's true of any community. I wouldn't want anybody coming by my yard and thinking, oh, she's not looking after that dog properly and take him. I'm not going to tolerate that either. Northern Reach Rescue Network doesn't put up the dogs for adoption. Instead, after a short stay with foster families in Thunder Bay, they're transported to southern Ontario, where they have a shortage of dogs available for adoption. Those people love their dogs. You can tell that they love their dogs, and the ones that send their dogs out, you can tell they love them even that much more because they're willing to give them up for a better life. Very good. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for the view from Northeastern Ontario. Claude Sharma, who's our hub meister, coming out of Laurentian University in Sudbury, and Jay and Jagannathan, who's in a van all the time, traveling all <laughs> over this province. He's our Ontario Hub's field producer. Until next time, guys, thanks very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.